thanks for coming out on, does this pass for a stormy night in Las Vegas? I don't know. <laughs> it's close. Uh, I'm Bill Brown of Rookies Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues and UNLV, thanks for coming out. We have our colleague from Brookings, Stephen Piper, here this week. Steve's a senior fellow at Brookings and director of the Arms Control Initiative. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about Stephen. He's had a, he's retired from the uh, foreign, uh, for foreign Service more than 25 years in the Foreign Service. Among his positions, he, uh, focus, he focused on U.S. relations with the former Soviet Union, now Russia, also Ukraine and other parts of that country. So you're going to hear from someone who spent a lot of time there, also had some interesting responsibilities. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. He was also U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine. That was 1998 to 2000. Also Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia on the National Security Council. So Stephen brings a wealth of perspectives to this topic, uh, a topic that was in the news even today, uh, and obviously with an election coming up, and even a with a debate topic on the focus of foreign affairs, this is a very timely topic. And even more timely than that is, as we speak, Brookings Institution Press is rolling Stephen's new book along with uh, colleague Michael Hanlon, who some of you may have heard speak out here. We have flyers on the book. Uh, if you didn't pick one up on the way in, please grab one on the way out and get one of the first copies off the press. It's called The Opportunity, Next Steps in Reducing Nuclear Arms. And Stephen, I will leave it to you. Bill, thanks very much. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Bill and also Brookings Mountain West for giving me the opportunity to come out here and spend a week and do some interesting things. I talked to people like Troy Wade uh, about nuclear testing. He spent about 35 years working on it, and tomorrow I'll have an opportunity to meet to uh, go up and see the old uh, test site. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about a topic that when the President and Governor Romney meet in about two weeks to discuss foreign policy, probably won't get a lot of attention. I mean, they'll talk about the Middle East, they'll talk, but arms control is probably not going to get a lot of coverage, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, because as uh, Michael Hanlon and I write in our book, we think that there's an opportunity uh, to do some things with arms control that are very much in the U.S. interest. And I'll start out by saying, you don't do arms control because you like to have fancy summit meetings. You do it because at the end of the day, we think the United States will be safer and Americans will be more secure with it. So let me cover three subjects in my outline. You know, first of all, you know, why further nuclear arms control, nuclear reductions would be in America's interest. Second, I'll talk about some of the opportunities that we see in 2013. And third, what are some of the challenges? So one reason why people may not focus much, because actually, you know, we've reduced a lot already. From a peak of about 31,000 weapons in the 1960s, uh, the total American nuclear arsenal now is about 5,000, uh, of which about 2,000 weapons are deployed. So there's been a lot of progress made, and some people say, you know, we've done a lot here. Moreover, you have the New START Treaty, which was signed by President Obama and then President uh, Dmitry Medvedev in April of 2010, and it's going to further reduce that number. Uh, it'll bring U.S. and Russian forces down to 700 deployed strategic delivery vehicles. That's a fancy arms control term, but what it basically means is an intercontinental ballistic missile in a silo or a submarine-launched ballistic missile in a missile to bomb a submarine, those that could be launched very quickly are counted as deployed. If you have a missile sitting somewhere in a storehouse, you know, that, that's not counted by this treaty. Uh, you have then the other limit, which I think is the, the most important limit, is deployed strategic warheads. And each side will have to reduce to 1,550. Now, I need to put a little asterisk there. This is arms control math, which is not necessarily the math that you grew up with. What that 1550 covers is that every warhead on an intercontinental ballistic missile or a submarine-launched ballistic missile counts. And each side has, is, it starts on the honor system by, de, by declaring that number. And then over the course of the treaty, as inspections are conducted, an American inspection team goes to a Russian missile base. And within an hour of their arrival, the Russians give them a list. Here's every deployed missile at this base. Here's the number of warheads on each one. And then that American team can say, OK, I want to go to this silo and check and, 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 and it proved to me that there's only three warheads there. Um, it's a different rule with bombers. Neither the American Air Force nor the Russian Air Force typically keep weapons on bombers. 
And so in the negotiations, they agreed each bomber would count as one weapon in that 1550. Now, bombers actually can carry a lot more. In, during the Cold War, American B-52s carried anywhere from 12 to 20 nuclear cruise missiles. Uh, the logic always was that bombers, because of their long flight times, it takes a bomber 8 to 10 hours to get to target, whereas a ballistic missile can arrive in as little as 20 to 25 minutes. You know, in many cases, the bomber might arrive actually after the war was pretty much over. So there's always been this sort of uh, more lenient treatment for bombers. So that, that's the arms control math. But these limits all will be implemented by February of 2018 under the terms of the treaty. So when you look at a stable US-Russia balance and the numbers are coming down, again, the question might be, do we need to do more? So let me give you some reasons why I think pursuing arms control is, in fact, in the US interest. First of all, I, I think there is value in further reducing the strategic threat to the United States. Uh, Russia will still have, under the treaty, about 2,000 deployed strategic warheads. And, and these are pretty sizable. Uh, the average Russian warhead is anywhere from 7 to 55 times the size of the fat man or little boy weapons, which are the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And while I don't think American generals in the Pentagon stay up late at night worrying about a Russian nuclear attack, it seems to me that as a general proposition, the fewer the number of Russian weapons that can strike the United States, the more secure we are. So that's the first reason. The second reason is to get at non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons, which right now are not constrained by any treaty. And so you have to ask, if we keep pushing down deployed strategic warhead when you've got this huge pile of tactical weapons that are unlimited, and this is an area where the Russians have a fairly significant advantage, at least four to one. Some counts suggest it's either six to one or eight to one. And we're working in the unclassified world here, so the numbers are a little bit fuzzy, but the Russians have considerably more. And again, they're not limited by any treaty. And it's a particular concern to our allies, NATO allies, Japan, South Korea worry about these things. Uh, these are the questions, are how much of a difference now, and maybe that difference between strategic and non-strategic is beginning to blur. It relates more to the range of the delivery system, I think, than the weapon itself. Uh, these are B-61 uh, gravity bombs. Uh, if those bombs are at Whiteman Air Force Base uh, for use on a B-2, they are strategic. Uh, if they are deployed as the Federation of American Scientists says they are at Aviano Air Force Base in Italy for use by an American F-16, they're tactical. Uh, my guess is if a nuclear weapon goes off anywhere near you, it's going to be pretty strategic from your point of view. <laughs> so getting at this, arms control, I think, can begin to get at these numbers. Third, transparency. Uh, the New START Treaty, and I would argue any other arms control treaty is going to have, Data exchanges, updates, notifications, probably over 2,000 notifications have now been exchanged under the New START Treaty on changes in strategic forces, inspections, and such. On-site inspections, each side's allowed 18 on-site inspections on the territory of the other. And this was a big thing, particularly for the US military, because they say this kind of transparency, it makes us a lot smarter about Russian forces. It allows us to avoid worst case assumptions and so we can make smarter decisions about how we equip, train, and operate US strategic forces. Uh, this picture, this is actually a dated picture. I, I couldn't find a non-copyrighted picture of a current inspection, but this is, goes back to the uh, 1987 treaty that eliminated medium range missiles between the United States and the Soviet Union. And that treaty actually allowed for inspectors, and this is a group of Soviet inspectors examining some dismantled Pershing II missiles. Uh, so it, it, it gives you information that the sides cannot get on their own. Oh. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is drawn from the Department of State about last week they put out, this is the latest data exchange that took place between the United States and uh, Russia. And this is for September 2002, 12. This shows in yellow each of the limits, and then you can see actually the Russians are closer to the limits than we are, but these limits don't kick in fully until 2018. And in fact, you can go up in, in uh, the first exchange in uh, 2011, Russia was below the 1550 limit. In the second exchange, they actually went above the limit, and then they came back down. And, and that's not a problem, because these are really a snapshot at a point in time but from February 2018, both sides need to be below those limits. And this is the kind of transparency, these sorts of numbers, these two numbers here, we can probably get a pretty good estimate using our national technical means, our surveillance satellites and such. 
This number here uh, is pretty hard to get unless you have the other side cooperating. Okay. Let's see. Um, we have a technical. <laughs> Uh, it's frozen again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a first. Yeah. Okay, that's yeah, that's where we want to be. Okay. Oh no. Am I going too far? Yes. Uh, we'll go back about three more. Right here. Yeah, that, that's okay. okay. Great. Okay, here's one other reason why I would argue, another reason I would argue why further reductions are in the U.S. interest. Uh, as long as there are nuclear weapons out there, the U.S. has to have a strong nuclear deterrent, and it looks like we're going to try to maintain a robust triad: intercontinental bombers, ballistic missiles on submarines, and intercontinental ballistic missiles. But we're now at a point where, in the next several years, the president's going to have to decide: how do you recapitalize the legs of the triad? We're going to have to make decisions about buying new ballistic missile submarines, new heavy bombers, and new intercontinental ballistic missiles. And these aren't cheap. Uh, right now, the estimate is that a new ballistic missile submarine to replace the Trident down here will run between six and seven billion dollars each. And that doesn't count the missiles or the torpedoes or those things. And that the, over the uh, lifetime of maybe 40 years, that that program construction operation will run about 350 billion dollars. For a new bomber to replace the B-52, although the expectation is the B-52 is going to be around for another 25 years, the Air Force is trying to get the estimate down so it'll only run about $550 million per bomber. So there's a lot of money here at a time when, as we all know, the budget is tight. There are other demands in the budget. So if you could bring down in an arms control agreement, reduce U.S. and Russian numbers, you would reduce the number of new weapons we would have to buy in the future. And that money goes either to reduce the deficit, or perhaps to fund military operations that are much more likely than thermonuclear war. The last goal, I'd argue, is our non-proliferation goals, is that today the United States and Russia, between them, have about 95% of the nuclear weapons in the world. And it sometimes makes it difficult for them to go and argue to countries, you shouldn't acquire nuclear weapons or increase nuclear weapons, because they come back and say, well, look at your numbers. To the extent that the United States and Russia are making significant reductions, it's going to put us in a stronger position to argue against other countries getting nuclear weapons. Now, that's not going to solve North Korea and Iran. They're not going to be affected by a new treaty. But what it does do is it allows us to mobilize diplomatic pressure to sanction those countries, to pressure those countries, and we're going to be in a stronger position if we're seen as reducing our uh, nuclear weapons arsenals. Okay, just a word on deterrence here. Uh, I'm a believer in nuclear deterrence. I, I spent my formative years in, in, in the Cold War at the State Department where I worked on medium-range missiles in the, uh, in the 1980s. And I think if you look at the United States and the Soviet Union, deterrence work, this idea that you indicate to a potential adversary that the risks and costs of his action far outweigh any gains he might hope to achieve. And with nuclear weapons, you can impose huge risks and huge costs. So deterrence worked in the sense that if you look at two systems as fundamentally opposed as the United States and the Soviet Union, you know, ideologically, politically, militarily, economically, you know, it's, it's, it's a surprise they did not go to war. And I think nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence were a big part of that. So nuclear deterrence works, but I'd put a qualifier there. And that is there are several points in the last 50 years where we got very, very lucky. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a picture of 50 years ago today. I was a second grader up in the San Francisco area learning about the Cuban Missile Crisis and for the first time realizing that there was an outside world out there that could be dangerous. Uh, and this is a picture of a uh, Soviet uh, missile installation on Cuba. <clears throat> well, in the end, the crisis was resolved successfully because President Kennedy, through deft diplomacy, made, you know, managed it in a very effective way. Uh, but uh, he chose to impose a naval blockade on Cuba. In doing so, he overruled the advice of most of his military and civilian advisors who advocated uh, airstrikes against the uh, Soviet missile installations, 
followed several days later by a ground invasion of Cuba. What we did not know in 1962, what we learned in 1992 when some of the participants came together for a conference was the Soviet commander on the island of Cuba, he could not launch missiles against the United States without a, uh, approval from Moscow. But he already had been given authority to use tactical nuclear weapons against invading American forces or against Guantanamo Bay. So again, had Kennedy made a different decision, one most of his advisors were suggesting, we might have spiraled down into a nuclear conflict. Uh, test errors. Uh, there was a famous story around 1980 uh, in NORAD where somebody put the wrong tape into the wrong computer, and for eight minutes, the North American Air Defense Command thought we had 300 Soviet ICBMs coming in our direction. And that caused things to happen. Uh, at Strategic Air Command bases around the country, B-52s were spooling up their engines and getting ready to launch. A process of learning the president had begun, and after eight minutes, so I said, well, wait a minute, and discovered this was really just a training tape. Uh, and then in 1995, uh, the United States and Norway launched a, sour, a sounding rocket. This had actually been notified to the Russians, but the Russians who were notified didn't alert the Russian military. They saw this rocket. They assessed it as perhaps a precursor strike against Moscow. And in one report, uh, Boris Yeltsin, his uh, nuclear suitcase was activated. And at that point, he kind of said, this makes no sense. So deterrence has worked, uh, and I don't think we throw it away lightly, but we have a couple of cases where we have to ask, are we going to be always this lucky? Uh, and this then leads to the question of lower numbers than zero. And President Obama in April of 2009 and laid out a vision and said of a world without nuclear weapons. And I, I'm comfortable with that speech because I, he also added some qualifiers and said, but until we get there, we have to maintain a strong nuclear deterrent and we have to understand that it's going to take a lot of things to get there. So the primary focus was, he, in the meantime, was reduce the role and number of nuclear weapons. Uh, and then ask the question, does zero make sense? I actually think from an American point of view, if I had a button here that I could push that would make all the nuclear weapons verifiably go away, I would be awfully tempted to push that. And that's an American perspective, which says, I live in the United States, I have friendly neighbors in Canada and Mexico, I have the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, so somebody who wants to come get me has to come a long way, and they have to fight through the world's most powerful conventional forces and the world's most powerful navy. So from the American perspective, that looks pretty good. Now, I think there are some questions that we have to think about is, how do you extend deterrence? How do you protect allies? And that becomes a bit more complicated in a non-nuclear world. And also, and I think the challenge is, you don't want to make the world safe for a repetition of World War II. Uh, so there are some issues there, and lots of challenges. You've got to bring all the nuclear weapon states into the process. You have to have verification techniques that go way beyond what we now have now. You have to have an enforcement mechanism. If I'm going to give up all my nuclear weapons, I want to know that there's a mechanism that will severely punish any country that even thinks of cheating. And finally, you have to have some resolution of these disputes that lead countries to acquire nuclear weapons, or at least you have to change their calculus so they say, having nuclear weapons will not help me resolve that problem. So I think there's a long way to go. I, I like the goal of zero, but I'm not sure if we're ever going to get there. Having said that, and I think making a series of steps in that direction where you bring nuclear force levels down can enhance our security and maybe put us in a position down the road where we can say, does zero make sense? Could we, in fact, do it? Okay, let me talk about opportunities in 2013 for arms control. And I'll start out with this picture. This comes from the Federation of American Scientists, and, who, and I think they do about the best work in terms of unclassified numbers. I put an asterisk up there about deployed strategic warheads, because this is not the number in treaty terms. This is the number that we think probably really are there. So this counts maybe three or 400 bomber weapons. Remember, each bomber counts in one of the treaty, but this would count the number of bombs at a base for use by American strategic bombers. I think the Russian number may be a little bit high because they probably count more towards a maximum number for the Russians. But this gives you the other numbers here, non-strategic or tactical weapons. The estimate is that the Russians have about a four to one advantage, 2,000 to 500. And then this category here, non-deployed strategic warheads, uh, that number, it's believed that the US military keeps one non-deployed reserve warhead for every strategic warhead that's deployed. And that's a hedge against geopolitical surprise or a hedge against technological surprise. What happens tomorrow if we find out that one warhead class has a severe problem and it won't work? The military is very conservative and has a weapon to, to sway up and to replace it. There's a question mark on the Russian side. Um, 
there's some number there, but I think we don't have a good fix, but it's significantly less than the US number. And then you have what I call retired warheads. On the US side, these are warheads that have actually been transmitted or they transferred back from the Department of Defense back to the Department of Energy. Uh, and they're basically waiting their appointment with the guys with the screwdriver to take it apart. But I think both in the, in, in the United States and in Russia, there's a bottleneck there. So the weapons are slower to be eliminated than we might like. So one opportunity in 2013 would be a new US-Russian negotiation to go beyond the New START Treaty. And uh, what uh, Mike and I suggest in our book is that a limit that uh, we might pursue would be to uh, restrict each side to no more than 2,000 to 2,500 total nuclear warheads. So you're counting deployed, non-deployed, strategic, non-strategic, basically everything on that previous list except for those retired weapons, and you deal with them in some other way. And then you would have a sub ceiling of 1,000 deployed strategic warheads. So you take that 1,550 limit in New START, bring it down 1,000, so you'd have a 35% cut in the weapons of greatest concern, those that are sitting on intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine launched ballistic missiles and can launch fairly quickly. Uh, and then we suggested a limit on strategic delivery vehicles, missiles and bombers of about 500 down from the 700. Now, what that overall limit does by having one limit is it forces the sides to make some trade-offs, uh, but allows each side, though, to, in essence, choose its own force structure. And I'll come back to that in just a moment, how it works. But the result would be about a 50% reduction on the US side, uh, probably a, a, a slightly deeper reduction on the Russian side. Uh, it would still leave the United States and Russia each with more than seven times as many weapons, nuclear weapons, as any third country. And it would still leave the United States able to maintain a robust triad if that, in fact, was what we wanted to do. Now, this is how this reduction works. Or, and what I've done is I predicted here a number of 2,000. This first column now is where the US is. The second, third column is Russia now, and then US later, Russia later. And the blue bar here is deployed strategic weapons, the ones of most concern. This reddish bar is the number of non-strategic or tactical weapons. And the green bar is deployed or non-deployed strategic uh, warheads, those strategic warheads that are in reserve. And what the 2,000 does, I assume each side is going to want to keep 1,000 deployed strategic warheads, because those are the ones that are of, of, of most interest. But then they can choose this additional 1,000. They can choose their own force structure. They can choose their own mix. And what I think will happen, or what I expect, is the Russians seem to be more interested in keeping tactical weapons. So they'll keep more tactical weapons, but it's a significant reduction in what they have today. And on the US side, there's an interest uh, probably in keeping more non-deployed strategic warheads. And so we'll have more in the end, but it's going to be a significant reduction. So that single limit forces the side. It's the mechanism that leads the side to a trade-off. And we also think, uh, more generally, it makes sense at this point to bring all nuclear weapons into the mix. OK, another issue I think that may be ripe for resolution in 2013 is missile defense in Europe. Uh, and, and we talk about this because this is an issue of concern to the Russians, because they say missile defense worries them because it could have an impact on their strategic forces. Uh, in September of 2009, President Obama said, well, we're going to change our plans for missile defense in Europe, and we're going to do the European phased adaptive approach. And what that basically means is it takes the standard uh, missile, the SM-3 right here, uh, which is now sea-based in phase one, but the missile will be in four phases uh, upgraded. In phase two, it'll actually be deployed on land in Romania. In phase three, it'll be deployed on land in Poland. But as each phase will have a more capable missile, and, and the theory here is that if Iran, which now has short and medium range missiles, is able to extend that range, we'll have in phase three and four more capable missiles that would allow us to intercept and deal with longer range Iranian missiles. And in phase four, uh, the concern is if Iran gets an intercontinental ballistic missile, which could perhaps reach the United States, the plan is that in phase four, about 20, 21, 2022, there will be an SM-3 that could have the capability, the range and the speed to deal with it. Now, this plan has all been endorsed by NATO. It was reaffirmed uh, in Chicago when NATO just met uh, it last May. And we're right now in phase one. Uh, the deployment in Romania is scheduled for about 2015. Now, this has caused a big issue with the Russians. The Russians have come out and said, we're very unhappy about the European phase adaptive approach. They don't really care about phases one and two, and perhaps not so much about phase three. But phase four, they said, bothers them, because at that point, they say the standard SM-3 missile in Europe is going to have a capability against ICBMs. 
And what the Russians did say is, we don't think Iran is going to have an ICBM anytime soon, and probably not until way after 2020, so this must be about us. And the Russian point gets down to this offense-defense relationship. And here's where the Russians, they do have a valid point. If American missile defense uh, forces, if they increase in numbers, if they increase in capabilities, at some point they could, in fact, disrupt that strategic balance between the United States and Russia in terms of strategic forces. You know, if we each have 1,550 warheads or 1,000 deployed strategic warheads, but in, on the US side, I have the capability to shoot down five or 600 of those Russian warheads, that disrupts that balance. So I think the Russians have a valid point in theory, but when I look at Russian plans or American missile defense plans over the next 10 years, I don't see any capability that in any serious way threatens the Russians. And that's kind of the nub of the argument now. Now, NATO has offered to have a cooperative missile defense. They would like to not have a single system, but have the two systems intersect and work together. Uh, the Russians so far have said they're interested, but they first want a legal guarantee that American missile defenses would not be directed against Russian strategic missiles. Uh, and the White House of President Obama said, I can't do that. Uh, and that's in part because of the Senate, where missile defense is, has a fairly high priority. And there is virtually no chance in the foreseeable future that a treaty that in any way restrained American missile defense could be ratified by the Senate. So the president has said, instead, he's prepared to offer a political commitment that he will not direct American missile defense forces against Russian strategic missiles. Uh, there's already been discussions between the Pentagon and the Russian Ministry of Defense about what are called jointly manned centers, where you would have uh, one, a data fusion center, which would have both NATO and Russian military officers working together 24 hours a day. You would take data from American sensors and, and radars, data from Russian sensors and radars, combine that, and then send that back to the two missile defense commands. And that would actually be of quite of interest to the American side, because if you're worried about Iran, the two radars that have the best view of Iran now are Russian-owned and operated. Uh, another center would be jointly manned that would talk about questions like operations and planning, and, and how would you, in fact, make the system so they would work together. But both sides are pretty adamant that, at the end of the day, It'll be an American slash NATO decision to launch an American interceptor, and it'll be a separate Russian decision to launch a Russian interceptor. And that makes sense because when you're talking about the decision time you know, for a short range missile, the decision time to launch an interceptor is probably two or three minutes. So you're not going to have the time to pick up the phone and call somebody in Moscow and say, What do you think about this? You're going to have to you know, make a decision very quickly. Uh, but what this does, if you had this kind of operation, this cooperation, it would mean a lot of transparency. Russian officers who are working together with their NATO and American counterparts would know a lot about American NATO missile defense capabilities. And I think at the end of the day, that would help them be assured that what we're looking at in the next 10 years would not be a threat to their strategic missiles. OK, uh, one other issue that may come up next year, I think it's, it's a little bit less likely, is the question of ratifying the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Right now, uh, we have a, a, a testing moratorium. The last American test was 20 years ago last month uh, up here in the test site. Uh, all of the other major powers, Britain, France, uh, China, and Russia, stopped their testing in the 90s. And really, in the last 12 years, the only country that's tested has been North Korea. And in 1996, uh, the United States led the negotiation of a comprehensive test ban treaty that would prohibit all testing of nuclear weapons. Uh, underground as well as above ground. Uh, it was not ratified by the Senate in 1999, and there were, there were two sets of concerns. One was the Senate said, how are we going to maintain the reliability of our nuclear weapons if we can't test? And the second question is, how do we know that we could catch somebody else if they cheat? Now, in the last 12 years, um, I think the administration ha now has a better story to tell in terms of answering those questions. Uh, first of all, there's been the Stockpile Stewardship Program run by the Department of Energy, which has been devoted to finding ways using computer simulations, other non-nuclear weapons explosion tests, to put us in a position where we can say the stockpile can be maintained and we are confident that it will be reliable. And I define reliable for the nuclear stockpile as if at presidential direction he wants a nuclear weapon to be detonated somewhere, it goes off, and any of the time it doesn't go off. But, but that kind of reliability. And so the, the, there, I think there, there seems to be confidence now. And, and for the last uh, 12 years, 
uh, the directors of the National Nuclear Labs and the, head of, and the commander of Strategic Command have been able to certify that they're confident that the stockpile is reliable. So this maybe put us in a position to go back and answer that question in 1999 and say, yes, in fact, we believe that we do have the means that would allow us to maintain the reliability of the, of the arsenal without testing. The other thing is that the monitoring system is, is, is greatly improved. And not only have US techniques advanced, but there's now an international monitoring system that was set up by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Office in Vienna, which, uh, when it's fully operational, will have 300 sensors, seismic sensors, uh, uh, air sensors that will basically sniff the air to detect radionuclides that might be generated by a nuclear test. It'll have uh, hydroacoustic uh, uh, sensors in the water that would hear the explosion of any test underwater. And the, 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 the people who run the system in Vienna are reluctant to get into specifics, but the general assumption is that the capabilities of the monitoring system would allow us to detect any test with a yield of one kiloton. And for many places, including places of concern like North Korea, we could probably detect a yield down to 0.1 kilotons. And at least for a new nuclear power, it, it may be hard for them to do a test that low, but it's probably not militarily significant. So I, I, I think we're in a situation where we can say the verification mechanisms are improving in a way where we can answer the question, say, we have greater confidence, much greater confidence in our ability to detect cheating. I would argue one other advantage for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is it seems to me this locks in an area of American advantage. Uh, and, and we conducted in the United States, uh, in the South Pacific, uh, uh, here in Nevada, and at a few other sites in the United States, more tests of nuclear weapons than any, the rest of the world combined. Moreover, I think we learned a lot more from those tests than our people did. And, uh, an anecdote, uh, in 1988, I was um, at the uh, American Embassy in Moscow, first time I met Troy Wade, because he, he came with a group of Americans because there was an agreement between Washington and, Mo and Moscow to do a joint verification experiment where we would be on site to monitor the size of a Soviet test and then they could come to Nevada and my, monitor the size of an American test. So we went out as the advanced team. Uh, we went out in February. I'm not sure that there was a lot of you know, uh, choice, but F February in semi politin sky. I, I remember we were all dressed up in our Air Force survival parkas. But uh, several times the uh, Soviets took us out into the test site and at one point, uh, they showed us a hole uh, that they had drilled uh, for a test, an upcoming test. And um, uh, one of Troy's colleagues uh, from uh, one of the drillers said to come out from the Nevada test, I guess, says, wow, it, this hole's about maybe three feet in diameter. He goes, they're going to be really surprised when they get to Nevada. I said, well, why is that? And he said, because we typically drill our vertical shafts 10 feet in diameter. And I said, why would you do that? The weapons aren't that big. And he goes, no, but that gives you that much more space to hang instruments to collect data in that split second before the, weapon, before the instruments vaporize. So it seems to me that we're in a position now where we probably, A, know more than anybody else about nuclear weapons, uh, and, and B, we have, I think, a pretty developed program to allow us to maintain the reliability of the weapons. So a test ban, I would argue, I think makes sense if we can freeze anybody else from catching up. Okay, one last uh, opportunity, which a little bit more long-term, not for 2013, but at some point we begin to think about how do you multilateralize the process? Because if you're going to be serious about US and Russian reductions going low, at some point it can't be just an American and Russian process. Uh, I think we could do one more treaty. We could come down to 2,000 to 2,500 weapons without imposing constraints on other countries, although it might be nice that they would accept some limits. But if you go below that number, you're going to have to bring in Britain, France, China, and the other countries that have nuclear weapons. Now, there's a discussion going on now among the UN Security Council permanent five countries, uh, US, Russia, Britain, France, and China, that are beginning to talk about some of these questions. Now, they're, they're starting out at, on easy ground. They've begun to talk about concepts, common terminology. But perhaps over the next several years, that could begin to evolve into a mechanism where you begin, to, or you, we could begin to persuade some of these countries, maybe not to reduce, but at least to cap. So that while the United States and Russia are coming down, you don't have a country like China building up. OK, so let me give you four challenges I see to arms control in the next several years. First of all, the Russians. <laughs> um, President Obama, when he signed the New START Treaty in April 2010, said, I want to go beyond this in a step-by-step -step process. And, and it is on record to say, I want a new negotiation to bring in not only, or limit not only deployed strategic warheads further, but bring in both tactical and non-deployed strategic warheads. And what you see on the Russian side right now is not a lot of enthusiasm for new negotiations. That's been for the last two years. 
Now, I think part of this is that they're still trying to figure out where they want to go with nuclear weapons at a time when nuclear weapons is very important to Moscow's self-image or what they, they like to see, which is Russia as a superpower on power with the United States. And if you take nuclear weapons out of the equation, you know, it, it's hard to make that argument. But, you know, but right now, in nuclear terms, the United States and Russia up here, everybody else is down there, and the Russians like that gap. The Russians have also linked the uh, nuclear reductions issues, such as missile defense. As I explained, I think one of the reasons why they've been difficult on missile defense is because they worry about that offense-defense relationship. And they worry about also the inferiority or some of the disadvantages they see in conventional forces. I think a big issue, though, is that they're waiting to see who's going to be president in 2013. Uh, I had a conversation with a senior Russian official back in May of 2011. And I said, well, you know, we, ought to, we ought to try to build on New Start. There's some momentum. Let's go. And he basically said, nope, we're not doing anything for another year and a half. And I said, why not? And he goes, we need to know who's going to be in the White House in 2013. And I, I believe here the Russian calculation is that although a lot of times when you go from a Democrat to a Republican to a Democrat, there's continuity in foreign policy. From the Russian perspective, if you look at what happened going from President Clinton to President Bush to President Obama, you saw very significant changes in American arms control policy and also in American missile defense policy. So I think here the Russians have basically been reluctant to make an investment with this administration because they're worried that there's a chance that in 2013, if there's a Republican in office, American policies on both arms control and missile defense can go in a very different direction. And once our election's behind us, perhaps we'll see a, we'll get a better view of what the Russian position is going to be. Now, I would argue, though, that there are some reasons the Russians have, and there are some incentives the Russians might have for further negotiations. And I'll show two. One is, this goes back to that data exchange from, uh, from uh, last month. If you notice, uh, on the Russian side, there's numbers in red. The Russians are already below the limit of, on strategic delivery vehicles and are already below the limit on deployed warheads. Now, some American analysts say, if you look at Russian trends, the age of their current force and the fact that they're building new missiles at a relatively modest rate, that that 1499 number in a few years might be down as low as 1200 or 1300. One Russian analyst, uh, Alexei Arbatov, says Russia could go low as a, low as 1,000 to 1,100. Uh, the US military, on the other hand, is planning. They, they're going to be at 700. They're going to be at 1,550. And they've got that locked in. So one possibility is that the Russians want to maintain closer parity is that the Russians would build back up. The other alternative, though, would be another negotiation and try to bring these numbers down. Uh, so that, that's one incentive the Russians might have. The second incentive gets to this number here, these non-deployed strategic warheads. And as they reduce, uh, from the evidence that we have on the, uh, um, in the non-governmental world, when the Russians reduce missiles, they take missiles out of service, destroy the missiles, and the missiles they keep in service have, a full, war have full warhead sets. What the US military is doing with its Trident missiles on its submarines and its Minuteman ICBMs is uh, it's reducing sub-missiles, but on the remaining missiles, it's taking warheads off. And those warheads go in storage, they become non-deployed. So under New START, the plan is that uh, the average Trident missile, which can carry eight warheads, will carry about four and a half warheads. It's still going to have three and a half spots on average to put a warhead back on. Uh, likewise, most of the Minuteman ICBMs uh, could carry three warheads. They'll only carry one. You could put two warheads back on. And these warheads will be sitting in storage. And, and what this basically creates is a situation where were the treaty to break down or there would be some huge crisis between Washington and Moscow. And these are very hard to foresee. But if that were to happen, the US could fairly quickly add about 1,000 warheads to its deployed stockpile, uh, and, and the Russians couldn't. And I, I've had conversations with some Russians that say that, that bothers them. So there may be some reasons that the Russians have to get into this negotiation, uh, even though they're going to wait to 2013. OK, the second challenge we have is the question of NATO allies and assurance. Uh, and again, this, this is coming from the Federation of American Scientists. It's believed that about 200 American B-61 bombs are deployed in Europe. Uh, little red dots there, uh, two bases in Italy, one in Turkey, one in Germany, one in Belgium, and one in the Netherlands. Uh, these are the only nuclear weapons that are deployed outside the national territory of any country. Uh, and the Russians have been pretty clear that they would like to see these weapons uh, brought back to the United States. Uh, in fact, at this point, the Russians say they don't want to talk about tactical weapons until the Americans pull all the weapons out of Europe. Uh, and that's, just, that's not going to happen. NATO's made that clear. But if you got into a negotiation of the kind that, that Mike and I talked about and got down to 2,000 to 2,500 weapons, 
I think the Russians would say, but there has to be these conditions, all weapons must be based, based on national territory. And that will be a challenge within NATO because for a number of countries in Central Europe, the Baltic states, Poland, they still see that presence of American nuclear weapons as valuable, as, as a symbol of American security commitment. Uh, and it's interesting, when I talk to people in Washington, I don't think Washington, there, there are very few people who say, we want to have these 200 bombs in Europe to deter the Russians. But they do see it as important to assure those allies who are still uncertain about Russia. So at the end of the day, do we get an agreement where NATO basically says we're comfortable with the withdrawal of those weapons, that it doesn't provoke some kind of a crisis with NATO? Third challenge is going to be verification. Uh, right now, because of the, the system that's set up, because we can track deployed strategic missiles fairly well, and then we have the opportunity to go to a Russian missile base or a Russian submarine base and say, OK, you told us that there were three warheads on missile tube number six on that submarine. Bring it in here and show us. We have pretty high confidence that we can monitor the deployed strategic warhead limit. If we start talking about monitoring tactical weapons, almost all of which are not on any kind of delivery system, and non-deployed strategic warheads, these things are sitting in bunkers and storage areas and storage chambers, um, we're going to be entering some new ground for both sides. Uh, you're going to have to talk about letting Russians into a place like this to verify the number of weapons. And it's not just counting the weapons to check your count, but they're going to have to have some kind of device that allows them to say, is that really a nuclear weapon? I mean, that, that looks like a B-61 bomb, but it also, you know, who knows what's inside? And so there has to be some kind of a way that they can tell there's a mass of plutonium or highly enriched uranium in there consistent with a nuclear weapon, but you also want to divide, design that device so it tells them that, but it doesn't tell you all the neat little things that you put in there, because the sides aren't going to be prepared to share that. So I think these are not problems that cannot be solved, but it's going to require on both sides uh, taking steps that they haven't had to take in the past. And I think, at, the, at least initially, when you talk about monitoring limits on warheads that aren't on ICBMs or SOBMs, you're going to have lower confidence. And that could be an issue for the Senate, because the Senate likes to have high confidence that we can monitor treaties. Uh, and we may be in a situation where you have a choice. You accept an agreement where there's a high level of confidence in our ability to monitor the deployed strategic warhead limit of 1,000. To monitor the rest is a little bit less. But maybe that's a better situation than what we have now, which is there's no monitoring of those tactical weapons. And the Russians could build 30,000 because they're not limited. Finally, the last challenge would be Senate Republicans. I don't want to get political here, uh, but it was pretty clear in the debate uh, on ratification for the New START Treaty that there's a lot of skepticism uh, on the Republican side of the Senate, and the two-thirds of whom have to vote to ratify a treaty or to approve ratification of a treaty, that there's a lot of skepticism about arms control. Uh, this is one thing I think the Obama administration was caught by surprise, a lot of people in the arms control community were caught by surprise, was how hard the, verifi or the ratification debate proved to be. Uh, and, and, and people looked at and said, well, it was hard to understand. In, in 2002, President Bush signed the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty. It set a limit of 1,700 to 2,200 weapons on each side. Not much different from the 1,550 deployed limit in the New START Treaty. But President Bush's treaty was a page and a half long. It had no verification measures, no agreed counting rules. At, at one point, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, to suggest that the Russians weren't counting the same things that we were counting. Uh, President Bush's treaty was approved by the Senate for ratification by a vote of 95 to 0. Uh, and after some struggles, uh, the Obama administration was able to get 71 votes for its uh, New START treaty. So I think that's going to be an issue. Now, a second issue here, which is, I think, perhaps the administration, if uh, President Obama's reelected, that they're going to have to worry about is, as part of that debate, uh, as part of the effort to secure ratification of New START, is the administration made commitments about modernizing the American triad and also about spending money to keep up the nuclear weapons complex so that, in fact, they were in the position to maintain the reliability of the American arsenal. And there's a sense, uh, and with a little bit of basis on the Republican side, that the administration has not fully lived up to that commitment. So that, that may make a, a, a difficult issue. And then finally, a question that's going to come up is, you know, do we do this by treaty or unilateral steps? Uh, I think the Senate does not want to see unilateral actions, but in fact, if you look at the, both the George Bush administrations, uh, both of the, during those administrations reduced the American nuclear weapons levels by about 50%, a lot of it done unilaterally. 
Uh, I personally would prefer to see treaty not only to give the Senate their constitutional say in the process, but I think treaty limitations tend to be uh, more lasting and more sustainable. So just I'll close up with just a couple comments on prospects. Uh, first, I think if President Obama is reelected, you know, he's already said he wants to go further, that he wants to do uh, another round of negotiation with the Russians that would involve all nuclear weapons. Uh, Governor Romney has clearly been more skeptical about arms control. Uh, he called at one point uh, the New START Treaty uh, uh, President Obama's greatest mistake. Uh, and I think he shares a lot of that skepticism that we saw in the Senate on the Republican side about arms control. But I wonder, I, I, I always think that particularly on foreign policy, campaign rhetoric may not be the best indicator of what you do in office. Uh, if uh, Governor Romney is uh, elected president in four weeks, you know, he's still gonna face the same tight defense budget requirements. And if you looked at the speech he gave a few days ago at uh, Virginia Military Institute, you know, his big thing about building up the military was not about nuclear weapons, it was missile defense and building up the Navy. Well, you may not be able to do all that, all that at once, and, and perhaps the defense budget issues and the pressures may have an impact. There's also, I think, some NATO considerations, is right now the United States has a position with NATO where NATO's very comfortable about it, NATO members are comfortable about the nuclear posture, including the fact that there's still 200 American nuclear weapons there. Now, countries like Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, I think, would like to see those weapons gone, but they're comfortable because part of the posture is an American effort to reach out and engage Moscow and negotiate. Uh, and if Governor Romney becomes president and he does not make that effort, he may see an erosion of support in NATO for the nuclear position. And this is very much like what happened in 1981 when Ronald Reagan became president. Now, believe me, I was in the State Department at the time negotiating a new arms treaty with the Soviets was not high on his list. But within eight or nine months, he had negotiators in Geneva meeting with their Soviet counterparts. And that was because NATO was going forward with a dual track decision, which involved a deployment of American weapons in Europe, but also a negotiation. And the European allies just told him, if you're not negotiating in a serious way, there's no way we can sustain support for the deployment track. So there may be reasons that, although his inclination may not be towards arms control, that uh, Governor Romney, if elected president, would find that he is doing more arms control than he now anticipates. And as I said, I think there are some possible incentives for Moscow to negotiate. I try to be optimistic. I think there's a big opportunity in 2013, and uh, the question is, will we use it? I hope the answer to that will be yes. And I apologize for running a little bit long, but I'd be happy to take questions. Yes? Uh, yes, um, the non-proliferation treaty, right. um, it outlawed or banned uh, reprocessing nuclear fuel within uh, the United States, and we send it to, well, we send, I'm sorry, nuclear waste uh, to France, uh, UK, Germany. No, no, no. No, that, 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 was a, that was a U.S. policy choice not to reprocess. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, I mean, it basically has a bargain where the, the nuclear weapon states, and at the time, uh, and there's something kind of called the five official nuclear weapon states, the United States, Russia, Britain, France, and China, they basically committed to work towards nuclear disarmament. And then they also agreed that civil nuclear technology could be shared with other countries. And then everybody else agreed, we will not acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, this is one of the points at issue with Iran. Iran is a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and there are a lot of suspicions that what they're doing now is aimed, if not at acquiring a nuclear weapon, at least at being in a position where they could very quickly move to uh, have a nuclear weapon. Uh, but the decision about not reprocessing uh, nuclear waste in the United States, it, that was not mandated by the treaty. That was a U.S. policy decision. Is it a national security concern? Uh, if it's unrelated, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, that if it's a big national concern. It, it was a concern about the question of do you create more plutonium as, as, if you do the reprocessing, and the policy decision here was, you know, we're not going to go down that route. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been doing some work on uh, uh, war powers and trying to get some more clear definition of war powers, and there's been some books coming out. And, you know, with, with, with Congress's reticence and, 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 uh, what, and even in, in the political sphere, what I'm kind of seeing is that we don't have, like, real debates. Mm -hmm. And Congress doesn't have a real debate. I mean, they, they you know, a, a treaty gets brought up and then they fight rather than... No really getting the process developed. And one of the areas that interests me, I guess I've been reading, and I'd like a question here, is, is China maybe 
developing faster, they may have some underground storage. And, and what, what do you think is uh, China's trajectory? Yeah. And, and the question, too, it, with that is, where is China going with those? Yeah. Yeah. Who are they? Are they a threat to Turkey? Yeah. Or, or are they a threat yeah. to India? No, Japan, I, that, that, I think, or are they Ch a Russia friend? Or anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good question. And actually, I think some people worry and they say, if the United States and Russia keep coming down, I mean, right now, when the, when the United States and Russia each have about 5,000 nuclear weapons, and, and most estimates I've seen suggest China has about 300. Despite the talk of the tunnels, I think those have other purposes. Uh, but the concern is, you know, at this point, China would have to make a huge investment to catch up to the United States and Russia. Well, the concern is sprint to parity. If the United States and Russia come down, 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 at some point do the Chinese say, it doesn't take that much of a, an investment. In fact, we're co-equal with the United States and Russia. So that's why I say at some point, I mean, I, I could see maybe Russia going down to 2,000, 2,500 total nuclear weapons. I don't think Russia moves below that, and I suspect maybe even Washington won't move below that unless China says, okay, we're prepared not to increase. Uh, because, and the, the, that, that'll be difficult because the Chinese position, basically when you talk to them about nuclear reductions has been, you know, when you get down to 300, give us a call. Uh, the, and, but part of it, I think, on, on the Chinese side, I mean, what they're trying to do, I mean, I, I, the Chinese, in my estimate, um, they, they believe in what would be called cla minimal deterrence. I, my sense is that the Chinese believe that they can put a nuclear weapon on Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, I'll spare Las Vegas and go for Denver. If they can do that, that's likely to deter Americans from most things that they would want to deter us from. And that's probably not a bad calculation. So at least so far, it seems to me, well, and certainly the, the Chinese, to be sure, I mean, they have been modernizing their forces. They're, they're, they're developing multiple warheads for the missiles. They've gone and they are now uh, building a, a submarine that can carry ballistic missiles. So they, they are doing some things. But the pace over the last 25 years has been pretty modest, which suggests that they so far don't see a requirement uh, to build up to US-Russia levels. And hopefully in this process, at some point, you could multilateralize so you could keep the Chinese on uh, capped. And then maybe they would go down as, uh, as the US and Russia went down further. Yeah. Is there an issue in the downsizing with the weapons grade uranium and how that, you know, the uh, fear of it getting traded into the markets? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's, yeah, there's a question, and this was actually a big part of the Nunn Luger program in the 1990s, and this was the Cooperative Threat Reduction Effort, uh, which did things like provide funding to places like Russia and Ukraine when they didn't have a lot of resources to help dismantle their missiles and bombers and submarines. Yeah. But one of the questions was then, what do you do with, if they dismantle a nuclear weapon, where do you put the uranium, where do you put the plutonium? Because you don't want that to fall into the wrong hands. And so a lot of the effort also that was done in the cooperative threat reduction effort was in fact to uh, strengthen the security of facilities like that. And give you one anecdotal, I, when I was in Ukraine at the end of the, 19, at the 1990s, uh, on the outskirts of Kyiv is a, was, or was a research reactor, it's since been converted, but it was a research reactor that was fueled by highly enriched uranium, bomb grade uranium. And uh, I think the first time the Department of Energy guys went out there, they came back and they said, uh, there's this stuff there that would be of real interest to somebody who wanted to make a nuclear weapon, and it's sitting behind a wooden door uh, with not a lot of security. Uh, and when I went out in 1998, it was about three years after we'd finished there to go out and, and, and mark uh, the work there. Uh, what you saw was a bank vault. Uh, the building, which used to have trees around it, we, they'd leveled everything for about 75 yards out in all directions. Asphalt, no trees, no bushes, triple fences, motion detectors, lights. It was a world-class facility. So there was a lot of US effort put into helping the Russians in those countries secure the stuff. Uh, the focus in the last couple of years now has been on those countries where they only have a little bit of highly enriched uranium, like Ukraine, is getting Ukraine to basically transfer that either to US custody or Russian custody. And then we help the Ukrainians convert their reactors so they can run on low enriched uranium. And that's reducing the, amount, the number of points around the world where there are these highly enriched uranium stocks. And then the question comes, what do you do with the stuff afterwards? There was one great program, which is just about what, going on now 20 years. It's called uh, megatons to megawatts. And about 500, megaton, uh, 500 uh, metric tons of surplus highly enriched uranium that came out of former Soviet nuclear weapons. Uh, what the Russians basically did is they took it, 
they blended it down into low enriched uranium and they ship it to the United States and it's then fabricated into rods for US nuclear reactors. So about 10% of this light is actually coming from nuclear weapons or former nuclear weapons out of the Soviet Union. Great use for it. <laughs> yeah. Joint station that would monitor Iran, would it be most likely in Russia where they're currently yeah. monitoring, or well, would it be a more neutral territory? Yeah, yeah the idea um, it was there were some discussions that took place in the first couple of months of 2011 between the Defense Department and the Ministry of Defense. And what they came up with was sort of the idea was two jointly manned centers a data diffusion center and a planning operations center. And the idea was what you could have one in, a, one in NATO territory somewhere in Europe and one in, in, on Russian territory, perhaps Moscow. So each side would have a site, but, but the focus was really not so much location, but having a place where you had Americans and Russians working together uh, and again, the, having a lot of more information, and that would raise the Russian confidence level that the missile defense systems that we're putting into Europe won't be a threat to them. And I, I think the Pentagon's right on this. Uh, the Russians so far don't agree, and, and we've got to find a way to persuade them. Uh, otherwise, I think missile defense becomes a pretty contentious issue again. Yes, uh -huh. How concerned should we be with the security of the uh, weapons uh, in Pakistan? Yeah. <laughs> I'll I give you two options. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on Pakistan, but Brooklyn's has a couple people who are. And, and what, when I've asked them that question, they said the Pakistan military is very professional and very conscious of the importance of safeguarding the weapons. And, 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 and the weapons are kept separate from delivery systems and, and such. So that makes me feel reassured. When I look at Pakistan, though, as a country, and you see that you know, the Pakistan Central Authorities, there are large parts that they can't control. Al-Qaeda operates there, things like that. That makes you nervous. Uh, and so uh, I, I think the Pak military is trying to be very responsible in controlling these things. Uh, and th there was I, reports of a lot of help. Uh, after 1998, uh, there was sort of a freeze in nuclear discussions between the United States and Pakistan. But the US government included, encouraged some track two dialogues. And among other things, these track two dialogues were passing information, for example, like permissive action links, things that you could put on your weapons that would make the weapons inoperable unless you had the codes to actually arm it. And hopefully the PACs took that advice. Uh, but I think if you look at where Pakistan is more broadly as a country, uh, it's not the country where I would like to see a lot of nuclear weapons at the moment. I know. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering uh, why uh, this presentation doesn't consider environmental impact, 300 nuclear weapons, uh, according to positions for social responsibility, uh, atomic bullet, and enough scientists, yeah. would create nuclear winter, nuclear famine, sure. and, and, and life as we basically know it. I, I'm not sure that we disagree. I, I, I mean, I, what I'm arguing is, we, you know, I, I think the more realistic approach to getting down towards the number, and I think, you know, physicians for social science would argue that zero is a great number. Uh, I think that's, that's a goal we ought to be trying to work for. I don't know if we can get there. But in the meantime, what I'm trying to talk about in this presentation are what things that you could do in the next several years that would move you in that direction. Uh, it would be great. I mean, you, you could consider going numbers below 2,000. But frankly, you know, I've had several Russians tell me that there's no way that Moscow would consider going below 1,000 deployed strategic warheads unless you had China limited and reducing and things like that. But we're aware that it's essentially suicidal if we use 300 of them. A unilateral attack by the United States without retaliation would create sad, self-assured destruction for yeah. the whole world. Yeah, there is that kind of discussion. I, I think you know, others have questioned that. Uh, I think that you're probably closer to being right than wrong on the point. Uh, 300 nuclear weapons would be, you know, if not civilization ending, would be a catastrophe far beyond anything we've ever experienced. Uh, but I think the political realities are you, in thinking about how you move forward in, in today's world, uh, I think going to those kind of numbers right away is, is not going to work. And, and what we tried to do when Mike and I wrote this book was, are there steps that you could take that would be realistic? And w when this book comes out, I fully expect there are going to be a lot of people on your side who say, gosh, Pfeiffer and O'Hanlon, you know, they weren't very ambitious here. They could have done a lot more. And there are going to be critics on the other side saying, you know, how can you give up this much? Uh, but again, what we're trying to focus on, what could have be done in 2013 and in the next administration so that by the end of either Obama's second term or, or uh, Romney's first term, you could say we're actually in, a, in a, a much better state and we're moving in the right direction on this.
Yeah, I mean, just to take that a little further. Yeah. But I think that this sort of calculation normalizes uh, nuclear weapons in mm -hmm. a way that actually furthers proliferation rather than lessens it. Uh, horizontal proliferation, the, the, the missile tests that we conduct from Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, the quadrupling of the output of um, uranium and plutonium parts and the non-nuclear parts at Kansas City that Obama has pushed through, the enlarging of the nuclear weapons budget even while the number of stockpiles is decreasing, yeah. the upgrades in delivery systems sure, yeah. and, and warheads and bombs, I think gives less confidence to the entire rest of the world, because it's not just a bilateral yeah. thing. Of course, no, I, Russia and the U.S. have more responsibility, because we've got it, and we've got way mo more than the rest of the world. Yeah. But it ignores the rest of the world a little bit. Um, and so I, I fear that this sort of calculation, unfortunately, yeah. undermines your state of okay. well, well, let me make an argument that may be counterintuitive. Um, I, I actually support the idea of putting a lot of money into the nuclear weapons complex. And that is because, no, it seems hear me like out. A huge sinkhole. When huh? Yeah, so but 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 here, but but here, but here, you know, if if you want, if you want to have a chance of uh, of getting ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which I think would be a desirable goal, uh, if you would like to reduce those 2,000 non-deployed strategic warheads, you know, right now the military basically keeps a lot of extra warheads because they're not sure, they're not fully confident that the weapons, you know, are going to work for ever and they want to have something that they can use to switch into the problem. If you have a more effective nuclear weapons complex, I think you'll be able to say, we have the confidence, and it will then allow the military to say, okay, we don't need these extra weapons. So I, I, I see the, the better complex as, in fact, a way to allow you to get the sorts of reductions that would bring you down from 5,000 weapons now to 2,000, 2,500. I mean, Jason says we should have the confidence. Sorry? Jason. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think that's a very important point. Uh, you know, the National Academy of Sciences Code report also saying it. You know, but this is a thing where the military tends to be usually conservative. And I think the Jason report, though, I think they're also talking about investments in there to maintain the weapons complex. So, in fact, that you can do stockpiled stewardship and have confidence without testing. So, just really quick questions. Oh, okay. um, what are we doing with the material that's aging out, basically? And two, what can the average citizen do to help get this process moving? Yeah. Um, on the age, are, are you talking about the nuclear materials or the yes. old? Yeah. Uh, well, what we're, the United States now is basically when weapons are disassembled, uh, what's called the pit, which is it right now basically goes into storage. Uh, and we're trying to figure out. I mean, there, there's, there's in particular, you know, trying to figure out how you deal with plutonium. Uh, I think the Russians already have a solution for highly understanding with the plutonium question. In terms of what I think citizens can do, I mean, one of the reasons why I think New START ultimately got 71 votes is was in fact in a lot of states there were actually people writing and expressing concern on this. I, I know some of my colleagues, you know, and Brookings were kind of an interesting situation. I mean, Brookings were banned from actually doing lobbying. But I know some of my colleagues in places like the Arms Control Association and stuff were mobilizing citizens, and they had a pretty good sense that some of those senators that were wavering were getting enough letters, messages, emails from their constituents that that probably helped them come around to a yes vote. Uh, so as these things come up, uh, I, I, I hope you'll get involved. Thank you. One more up okay. back. I'm curious to know what happens when you give this talk in another country, yeah. uh, when uh, the United States has attacked 250 oh, countries in this it is very short yeah. history and has exploded the only atomic bombs on top of people. Yeah. Uh, what, what sort of reaction? Do people really trust us? Yeah. No, well, first of all, I haven't given the talk in another country yet. And, and I, I think, as the point I made, I mean, when I talk about a world without nuclear weapons, uh, I think that's... That's a goal that the United States, I think, is serious about because I like that world. Now, if you're Russia and you're living next door to China, which has a population 10 times your size, getting the Russians to embrace the goal of zero is going to take a lot of work. Uh, but again, I think to the extent that the United States is seen as you know, perhaps not as fast as some might want, but is seen as moving towards reducing nuclear weapons, uh, I think that's going to uh, improve uh, the image of our approach overseas. And I'll give you an example. In 2010, early 2010, the Obama administration put out its nuclear posture review. 
which said, among other things, adopted the goal of reducing the role and number of nuclear weapons in US strategy. It said uh, the fundamental purpose of nuclear weapons was to deter nuclear attack. It changed the, nucle the negative security assurances in some ways. Uh, and then a couple of days later, uh, they signed the New START Treaty. A month later, you had the NPT Review Conference, which meets every five years. This is a review conference of all signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The meetings in 2000 and 2005 had ended in a disaster from the point of view of the Americans. I think in large part because of New START and the Nuclear Posture Review, the American diplomats there had a much better story to tell, and the outcome, while perhaps not ideal, uh, was certainly not hostile to U.S. interests. I, I, one more question. I feel we Troy, did you have a question or a comment? Well, one, well, one comment. Of course, I believe, I believe deterrence works. Uh, I also believe in nuclear zero, but I don't, it certainly is not going to happen in my <coughs> lifetime. But we talked yesterday a little yeah. about reliability. And, you know, I, I, I have a 1972 Datsun 240Z, which I just love. I can hardly get in and out of it anymore, but I love to drive it around this town. I would never start to Los Angeles in a car that old, never mind how many computer calculations say that it's going to be okay and the parts are all right and all of that. Uh, I think that that's a big part of, of, uh, of, of really making this work for the United States. We have to assure that, that sort of irrespective of what the final numbers are that we're going to keep as the deterrent, that we have high confidence that they're going to work. And that high confidence might require another nuclear test someday. Who knows? And as you know, I believe we don't do enough to keep that option open. No. But I, I'd like your comment, uh, Mr. Ambassador, before we close. Yeah. Well, as we discussed here, I, mean, I, I think um, uh, at the end of the day, I, I think we can get by without nuclear tests. And although, as, as we did in, in, the, in the book, we left open an option. As American nuclear weapons are aging. I think the last one was built 22, 23 years ago. And so the question is, can you continue to extend their life, which is right now the Obama plan is to do life extension programs to keep those weapons basically in, in service for the foreseeable future. Uh, one option that you might consider is if, if you get to a point where you're saying, gosh, this weapon was built 45 years ago. You know, the people who built it are gone. You know, we don't have the technologies anymore to build this weapon the same way. Uh, one might, and I hesitate to use the term because it came out, I think, the wrong way in the debate five years ago, was reliable replacement warhead, is a lot of the American weapons right now were designed for very specific things, and things such as you wanted to put as big a bomb in as low as weight as you could so you could have a small warhead. Uh, and so there's not a lot of performance tolerance in case a small problem could raise a question, would that weapon work? Well. I think in current circumstances, you don't need to have those same capabilities. So maybe you relax the performance requirements, and you have a more simple weapon. Uh, we can go to some of the designs that we have in the past and build that. I think one thing I would argue, and the Obama administration has said is its policy is, if you build a new weapon, you do not add any new military capability. So it could be a smaller yield, but the focus would be on having a weapon that would be sturdy and that would, would work if you need it to work. And it actually, at some point, might reach the point where it would be cheaper to do that than trying to continually recycle and, and extend the life of weapons that you know, could, could conceivably be 60 or 70 years old. So, so that may be an option that gives you a way out. And I think with that kind of uh, option reserve, I'd still argue that a, a ban on testing works in our favor, because if you can raise that bar and keep other countries from testing, uh, it keeps them from getting as smart as, as we are about nuclear weapons. I apologize for having to bring this to a close with a public session. Thank you, yep. Stephen, for a stimulating presentation. Thank you all for some great questions and discussion. Steve will be around if you have questions we didn't have a chance to get to. And just uh, as you walk out the door, uh, flyers for Steve's book is out there. Uh, our next talk will be a week from tonight. We'll start at 6 p.m. Uh, because of some commitments. We'll have Charlie Ebringer back. Uh, he's uh, talking about uh, energy issues. Uh, Charlie's talk will follow up on one John Banks gave just a couple weeks ago. Uh, some interesting observations and thoughts on the, the new natural gas and unconventional oil and how the U.S. is moving toward and can be energy independent. So another time we talk around election time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.